Hey there, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Welcome to this live conversation that I'm going to be having with Natasha Knight. Um, Natasha bravely volunteered. Um, so what we're what we're talking about today is that I wrote a book, uh, hopefully you know that, but I wrote a book called, I'll show you, The Career Stories Method. And the first step in the book is to write out these index card stories. And sometimes when um, people first write out the stories and they have all these stories, that's kind of the easy part. The part that, that has a little bit of art to it that sometimes takes a couple of tries to get at is to then take all the stories that you collected through the process, which typically takes people seven to 10 days, and taking those stories and then trying to make sense of what is the common arc across all of these. So what I thought I'd show you today is just a demonstration of what of what that looks like. <laughs> um, so we are, that's what we're, we're gonna talk about today. Um, so I'm gonna bring Natasha on. She has collected a bunch of stories. Uh, I'm going to listen to them, take some notes, and then by the end of our conversation, which will be about a half hour, I'll help her or I'll kind of give a suggestion of what I think will be a great career brand. Um, and then she can kind of, we can talk it out together. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to bring Natasha on. So, hey, Natasha. Hi, Carrie. How are you? Hi. I'm I'm really excited uh, oh, to do this. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think I think this is just a fun way for people uh, for people to learn. So that's that's what I'm excited about. All right. Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of what I'm seeing here, I'm just looking at um, I'm not getting the LinkedIn comments. I'm just getting the YouTube content uh, comments right now. But I will take questions at about um, the half hour point. So if you're saying something on LinkedIn, I'll check my phone at about a half hour. But we're just gonna we're just gonna talk. Um, so thanks for buying my book. No problem. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for volunteering <laughs> to do this <laughs> this call with me. Thanks for writing all your stories. Do you do you want to just dig into them? Sure, sure. Cool. I'm following right. your lead. Yeah. So what? Um, so you did the method. You came up with a bunch of stories. What mm -hmm. story do you want to share with me first of a moment of feeling great at work? I can start with story number one. I think I may have like subconsciously rank ordered these as I came up with them. <laughs> so we can start there. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. You go. I'm all yours. So uh, story number one is about what we used to call in the department where I worked at UNC Greensboro, we would call it advising day. Mm -hmm. And I was an assistant professor and we didn't have, well, although we had students that were assigned to us um, in the system, um, like the, the enrollment system or whatever, we had students that were assigned to us as advisees, we would have what we would call advising day. And what that basically was, was we would have all of these, all of our students for the entire department, undergraduate students come and someone would meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, normally about 15 to 20 minutes per student. And we would do this all day um, on a single day for the, for the semester. So there would be one day in, in the spring semester and one day in the fall semester. And we would just meet with them and hear what was going on, hear their stories about the semester, what classes were going well, making sure that they were on track with graduating on time for those especially who were seniors and for those who were um, earlier in their undergraduate careers, making sure that this was actually what they wanted to do. Because I think some people come into the, the major of nutrition thinking that it's something different than it actually is. Right. Um, so we would basically do a lot of listening and a lot of troubleshooting and a lot of um, degree planning with these students. And none of us were, um, like it's not like I was trained to be an undergraduate student advisor, um, but I loved it. Um, <laughs> and it was very quick to catch on, but I'm an introvert, but I love talking to these students all day for that one day each semester. Um, and it was, like exhausting and exhilarating all at the same time. Um, and it was a great way to get to know the students. I didn't have some that would specifically request me. And so that kind of was a signal to me that I was making a positive impression on those students. Um, 
And that meant sometimes they were gonna have to wait for like an hour because there were extra students in front of them already. Um, so that was a real, I think, um, testament to me of how fulfilling it is to work with students um, and how much I actually love to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, was there, so that's like a whole day. Was there a specific, like a specific mo like like moment, like moment in, 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 yeah, the in the day? Like, was there a, like a student that came, like, I wonder just the more specific we can be, was there like, a certain situation, like it, I, I could see how the people waiting an hour or two, right? Like a sold out coach <laughs> would feel great. But is that was there? Do you um, remember one? Or I can think just... of yeah, I can think of a oh, well. This probably happened more than once, but I can think of um, a student um, that I spoke with during advising day who had taken. Um, my intro to nutrition class, which was another story um, that I, I shared with you, but they had taken my intro to nutrition course and um, coming from high school, they said they, they were struggling in the course um, and she just had no idea. She, she didn't realize that she was supposed to like read ahead of time. She mm -hmm. said in high school, we would come to class, learn, and then we would go home. They would tell us what to go home and read. Yeah. And I said, well, in college, it's the other way around. We don't have time for you to catch up and learn everything in class. We're really just giving you a high level overview and making sure you understand um, key points. But you really have to take some responsibility to learn the content um, outside of class. And um, so she had that trouble during like her freshman year. And a couple of years later, um, she was a junior getting ready to go into her senior year and during advising day, she said, I remember you had that conversation with me and I was having such a tough time in that class and you gave me the information that I needed in that particular space to understand what I was doing wrong. Um, and that really changed my entire course for like how I studied and took, you know, responsibility for my classes. Um, and I couldn't believe it. Like I, you know, I just had that conversation with her. It's just kind of like, it was like a five minute conversation after class one day. Um, and to know that it made that type of impact on her was amazing. A couple of years yeah. later when I didn't even fully remember, um, I remembered her and I remembered the conversation, but it's not like something that I think about all the time. So that was one advising day story that was a huge success. Yeah, okay, I'm just taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I love that story. All right. Um, story two, let's just do them and then I'll okay. let you know what I see in them. Yeah. Is that okay with you? Does yeah, that that's, fine. Okay? that's fine. That's okay. fine. Um, <laughs> so my final MBA consulting project. So a lot of folks who know me know that I just finished what I hope will be my last graduate degree. Um, I was working. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. You can, you can I, stop taking I can them. Stop. <laughs> I can stop. So I just finished, uh, my MBA in December. And part of that uh, degree program, like to to complete the degree, you have to do a um, you have to do a uh, a final consulting project. So I worked with the nonprofit here in Richmond and worked with them on their domestic violence um, program and their emergency housing for domestic violence survivors. Um, I had to learn so much stuff for that project. I don't know anything about, well, I do now, but at the time, didn't know anything about real estate, didn't know anything about domestic violence beyond what we see in, um, you know, just uh, pamphlets or stories or, or what have you. Didn't know anything about programs for domestic viol violence housing. Um, and, it, you know, it took a lot of work to put together the proposal, work with my advisor to do that. And then, you know, with very little guidance, <laughs> complete the project. Um, and the project overall, the proposal was well received by my client. Um, I do think that if I can think of one particular moment in that process, it would have been the, um, not the very last presentation I gave, but the presentation or the, the conversation I had with them um, after I sent them the final report. Um, that was just amazing to hear them say, this is exactly what we needed. This is far and beyond what we thought. Um, 
we would, I think, I, I don't know that they were expecting that much from a graduate school project, <laughs> but <laughs> they said, this is, you know, this is exactly what we need. And we're, we can, this is something that we can actually use and mm. we anticipate being able to implement. I think that um, for a project that I had absolutely no subject matter expertise, that moment of um, being able to pull together like the culminating project or product rather being able to pull it all together and to hear them say that was um, was huge. So no kidding. Yeah. Oh, I love and in it like was it because the praise is always great. We love the praise. Was it the gap like was it the gathering of it or the writing of it? It was the gathering of the information. So yeah. being able to talk with stakeholders across, uh, I live in the Richmond, Virginia area. So being able to talk with stakeholders across this area about domestic violence and about housing for domestic violence survivors, um, learning what some of the challenges are. Um, I mean, you would think that if you're trying to do something that positive, um, that there wouldn't be a whole lot of pushback, but there is, you know, there's something that we call not in my backyard syndrome and learning about that and what some of the other organizations in the area have had to um, tackle was really eye-opening. So I think it was the learning um, yeah. and then being able to actually pull it all together into something that was useful. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. I love it. I'm already seeing themes. <laughs> so okay. Yeah, for, for anyone who's just joined us, um, I'm with Natasha, who's sharing gorgeous, oh, gorgeous stories. Like these are beautiful. These are really beautiful stories um, from like best days at work. Um, and then I'm listening to the stories and then trying to figure out if there's some some common themes so she can take all these experiences and go, hey, this is my career brand. This is what I'm really great at. So we're yeah. on to the story, story three. Um, okay, so the next story is um, coordinating a student-led journal article. Um, so I'm in public health and as a researcher, one of the things that we <clears throat> need to do as early and as often as possible, especially if you're in academia, which I'm not anymore, but I'm still sort of tied to that space, um, is to publish, journal, publish manuscripts in journals. So you create it, you send it off, someone critiques it, sends it back to you at least once <laughs> for you to, for you to um, make edits. And then hopefully after a couple of rounds of edits, they say, this is wonderful. We would like to publish it in our journal. So <clears throat> the first time that I had an opportunity to do that was in, um, when I was in my first master's degree, when I was working on my master's in public health, one of my instructors said, hey, I really think you should um, think about writing a paper about uh, your experience in this community-based course. It was the first course that the school or that the program actually held in the community um, and with community members in mind to the degree that we did for this particular um, semester. So, um, I thought about it and I said, well, I guess that means she sees something in my engagement in class. That's what I was gonna <laughs> say. Like that's yeah, incredible that you it were was selected. Pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, she, she was very instrumental, I think, in making a couple of decisions, in my, me making a couple of career decisions. So I hold her in very high regard. And so I said that meant that she sees something in my engagement in course, she's in, in the course, she sees something in my writing. So I'm gonna take a stab at it because I knew I wanted to go get my PhD after, and that would help um, to have that type of thing on my resume. Yeah. Um, so we announced the project, a few other students signed up, and I was sort of the, what we call the lead author. So I was the person most responsible for making sure that everything got done basically, um, and filling in on the writing if someone else couldn't, um, couldn't do it. So that meant that, you know, organizing our meetings, um, setting up the schedule for writing and assigning the sections, making sure we actually submitted it to the journal, being the corresponding author with the journal, um, and making sure that they had everything that they needed in response to their questions and their comments on our, on our paper. So we, after I think maybe two rounds of revisions, it was finally accepted. Um, and so it was 
um, amazing. Like I remember like sitting in the cafeteria at my new school when the email came through and I was elated. Um, and again, that's the, that's the prize that you were talking about before. But for this story, I can't think of like one specific moment. It was just that entire process because again, we learned so much about like, how does this work? Um, and then being able to share the stories of my classmates was important because we had to collect um, interview data from them or survey data from them rather, and then interview data from some of the department leaders. So it was just the, it was just the whole thing. I can't pinpoint one specific thing in that process that was like, wow. Um, but it was fascinating and it was my first paper. And then like, nobody can ever take that away from me because it's, it's out there now. Carrie, I can't hear you. Hold on. No, what happened? No. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So um, the next story was the mentoring breakfast um, story that I sent you uh, several years ago. I was the co-chair for the Mentoring and Professional Development Committee for a national organization that was really focused on improving the health of African Americans. And um, at some point we determined that, or we learned rather that our members wanted more hands-on mentorship from some folks who were more experienced in their careers. So we had to come up with a way to actually provide what they were looking for um, because we knew that we didn't have a whole lot of time to plan something for the annual meeting. And we knew that at the meeting, we wouldn't have a whole lot of time to actually execute something because we were going to end up having a really tight schedule as it was. Um, so we came up with the idea to have a mentoring roundtable where instead of the one-on-one -on -one speed mentoring, we would have groups of students and early career professionals seated at tables together. And then the mentors would actually be the ones to rotate instead of the, the mentees. Um, that day, uh, well, leading up to that day, we had tons of stuff to do, reaching out to mentors, confirming them, creating the schedule, making sure that um, we actually had a place to hold the event. And at the time, what we could afford was like coffee and some and some bagels, and that was it. But we were able to pull this off with um, without charging our mentees anything. And our mentors were all willing to do it for free. So we gave them uh, great certificates and letters of appreciation for their, uh, you know, for them to go back and share with their employers. Um, and then the big day um, of the actual event, we had a sold out event. Like we, for our first event ever, it was completely sold out. And um, we, it went off without a hitch. Like we had a waiting list. We had people waiting in the hallway to get into this event. And it happened that way for a few years later. Um, you know, I think that like the moment was the, that day, like having um, just that, like that hour and a half that we had, it felt like it was going on forever. And then it felt like it was over in like a second at the same time. Um, we were able to help so many people and that once like almost 80 people, we were able to help and make sure that they were connected to somebody who could provide guidance for them um, for their careers. So. Um, even now, some colleagues that I I met there, we we reminisce on that event. It's it was it was it was fabulous. And the second story with the lineup. Yeah, <laughs> people lining up for something that you coordinated. Oh, I hadn't made that connection, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> We're like in de in demand of like okay, um, that's. That's gorgeous. Uh, next one. For, okay. And I'll just say for people who are just popping in and being like, why is Natasha talking so much? Um, <laughs> she's sharing stories that she wrote, um, kind of using prompts from my, from my book. And I'm listening to the stories and trying to figure out what is the common theme between all these incredible stories that she's telling. Um, all right. Ready. Story number five. I think we're on five. Yeah. Yeah. Go so for it. This is about um, a national um, uh, healthcare initiative that I helped to launch in my one of my previous positions. Um, so 
we, when I joined the organization, I think we were supposed to launch this thing several months out. And then all of a sudden, one day we get a call from somebody's leader's leader. (laughs) And they're like, we need this out right away. So we basically had to get it out in less than a week. Um, But thankfully, one of my earliest tasks was actually to work on creating an implementation plan and protocol for the initiative. So we had already done, and then the team, before I even arrived, I completely want to give them credit because they, you know, initially came up with the idea and um, had already made a whole lot of plans around it. And so I just sort of came in and said, well, here's how we can, uh, based on the evidence, what we can put together for implementation. Um, So I had to finish that in just a few days and work with my team members to create a rollout presentation for our partners across the country who are going to be actually implementing the initiative, um, working with our communications team to develop language for a press release, which is not the same as writing like a scientific journal abstract. So that was fun uh, to learn a different type of of writing. Um, And then, you know, just collaborating with the team to make sure that we had all as much of it as we possibly could have um, in one space to uh, get it rolled out without like ruffling any feathers, if ruffling any feathers simply because it was something that was new and people already had plans in place. And we knew that this was going to be a heavy lift for some folks. So we executed as well as we could. There were some bumps along the way. Um, But I remember talking to um, one of my grantees who, I don't know if they, I don't know if they were fully confident that everything was going to work out um, in the beginning, but in the end it did. Like in, in places like Texas and California, they can have these events and reach thousands of people at one time, which is like in my little town, you can see behind me, there's like trees. <laughs> so I can't even imagine, but you know, they were able to pull off these wonderful events, like where they were reaching people in testing knowledge and helping people get connected to screening for um, this particular health condition. And um, it was amazing. Like the entire process was amazing. But I think hearing those stories from my grantees that they were able to pick this up and run with it and actually um, get it done under, um, you know, still having to do all the other things that they were initially planning to do, but they were still able to get this done too. That was, that was huge. So it was a big, big effort of let's help some people who really need, um, who really need help and who are most vulnerable to, to chronic disease. Yeah. Oh, you do. Um, you do really meaningful life changing work. Yeah, that's one of my values is to yeah. do meaningful work and make a difference. Yeah, like in yeah. every every um, story I'm seeing, like I'm, I'm like, oh, I can tell what's important to you. Yep, that's um, absolutely important. Yeah. So let's do one more so that okay. we can get into kind of making sense. So of the stories that you have left, what... Which one makes your heart sing the most? (laughs) Well, we already did one about my teaching. So I'll do the last one I sent you, which was the super late focus group. (laughs) Okay. So I was living in the D.C. area at the time, and I think I had to go to a town called Frederick. And if anyone knows anything about the D.C. area, like going out on 270 to Frederick at six o'clock is a nightmare. But it was my first time doing it and I had no clue and it was raining. <laughs> so <laughs> I was supposed to get there at 530 and I think I probably got there around seven. Like it was that bad. So I was going out there to do a focus group uh, with yeah. an organization that served families who were um, at the time we called people, you know, families in that situation homeless. Now we may call them unhoused, but at any rate, they were in um, pretty serious, you know, states of being um, in terms of not having consistent and, um, you know, safe housing. So um, I was supposed to go out there to do this focus group with them to learn what they were pleased with, with the organization that they were being served by and what they were facing that the organization had not yet been able to address. Um, And I put this in the story because I think it's pretty significant. I was a young black woman in a room with 
middle-aged, mostly white men and women. And in that space, they waited for me, first of all. Like, no one left. <laughs> no one <laughs> was angry when I got there. They were all completely understanding of the traffic yeah. and the rain. Um, and they, you know, they, they, nobody rushed the conversation. We had the full hour or so focus group. And they were very transparent and easygoing and willing to share their stories in a way that I think had I known what the what the demographics were going to be of the group, I may have gone in feeling a lot more nervous than I did. Um, but they made me feel at ease. <laughs> and they were completely, um, you know, open to telling their stories. And I just, I could not believe it. So I took a lot of care in writing up that focus group report and reporting back to the organization what um, their clients needed um, and what they were doing well um, and how they were able to help their clients make some pretty significant advances in getting their situations to be a lot better than they were. Um, I had just, I, you know, it was eye opening for me because I, relative to what those folks were going through was living a pretty privileged life and it never had my housing stability threatened. So I was humbled by their, um, that 90 minutes of being there, the hour to 90 minutes of being there, humbled by their willingness to talk to me, willingness to share things that were very personal. Um, and I took that responsibility of, you know, sharing their stories very seriously. Well, that's a beautiful story. I don't know if you see the comments. <laughs> I, I, I don't, you an inspiration, I don't. Tasha. This is oh, so thank beautiful. You. <laughs> yeah. Hi. I love, I love it. It's, um, so when you did the cards, did yeah. you come, did you come up with, like, did you compare the stories and did you come up with the skills that you saw in them? And what did you, what did you come up with? So the three that I came up with were yeah. compassion, mm. uh, teamwork and planning. Okay. Uh, those were the three <laughs> that I came up with. Okay, I'm I'm laughing, not in the I'm laughing because you chose these like teamwork and planning are just so overused. Yeah. Well and I don't I, feel like they give you they don't give the credit <laughs> for the and even the compassion, like for the kind of teamwork mm -hmm. that you that you do and the kind of planning. Like you do plan I think um I'm gonna go into advice mode now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> when I'm you, here but when for you it. talk, I think when you're talking about the planning, is that you don't just like plan, like you plan and you make it happen, and you also make sure that everyone feels included, even the even you know the voices and people who maybe never get their voices captured. You ha they are in those plans and those documents, and it feels like in a lot of the stories that you're telling, their voice or the perspective wasn't taken into account before. Mm. And that is super like that is like, um, you know, I haven't done a, a lot of community development work, but that's rule number one, right? Yeah, <laughs> so we don't sure. fly into communities yeah. and become the voice for them. We allow no, them, our, we exactly. help to go bring their voice back and go, can we make some, some smart decisions? And I, I think that you're really great at that. Okay. I would say maybe for me, the words that I use, and maybe this is for anyone watching is, is when when you're writing down those skills of trying to put it into words that are unique to you and that no one else is using because compassion okay. and teamwork and planning anyone could say that like i'm great <laughs> i'm super compassionate i'm great at working with others uh, you know and planning cool things mm -hmm. so think of other words for what compassion might mean for you and maybe what teamwork or describe it in a way like one of my super skills is problem solving, mm -hmm. but I can't say problem solving because right, everybody says problem does. solving. <laughs> so what, what I say is I love to solve problems like in the muck with people alongside them. Oh, I like that. So people go, oh, she's not, she likes to, you know, I like to sit beside you, William, put my arm around you, but like, I like to sit beside you and work on this, not be like, let me tell you what you're good at because of my quiz, right? right. Um, so the words I have, what I like, what I thought, the themes that I'm seeing, um, 
I might add a fourth one actually, but one is capturing the voices and the concerns of others. Hmm. Often oh when those voices aren't heard or shared. And I feel like you're doing it um, in a really respectful, compassionate way. But I think you're a, you're a master <laughs> at that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right? You capture the voices of those students who came to see you like one-to-one -one and giving like them advice. Mm -hmm. You did it. Um, yeah, you captured even for that conference for the mentees for like that for that day. You did it in the last story. Um, yeah, like that's gorgeous. You do that. Number two, she's got a sorry, <laughs> has, like, a work a person in contractor her house. that's like leaving. So <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to do everything. <laughs> yeah. Do you but need he's to done go? now? No, okay. no, no. He's done, and I can just okay. like. You may see me walking around, but I'm listening because it's really cold okay. outside. Yeah, cool. Um, second, um, I put delegating or giving order, or maybe it's providing order to, to things because a lot of your stories are about um, something needs to be done and you you make it happen, right? Like you, um, and I feel like you make it happen <laughs> very last minute. Right. Um, but I think this like, yeah, pulling the resource, like I put resourcefulness, um, pulling things together. You use the word pulled together, I think, like six times. Oh, wow. So that's a word that you could use, because if you're if you're telling the story and using the words like, oh, I pulled it all together, I got everyone <laughs> pulled it all together. You're naturally going to say it. So why can't you just be like somebody who captures the voices, helps to capture and share the voices of other people or gives right. voice, right? And then like, no, not give voice. That sounds awful. Um, but, and then pulls it together because you okay. you use that. And then the, the, third, the third thing I'm seeing is just this resourcefulness. And... And it's and it it can be on like the little level of you talking to that student and her not knowing <laughs> to read the book in advance, right? And and right. having that and maybe like so I feel like that resourcefulness, but also the like the eye of the eye for detail of what to look for, because mm -hmm. you heard that and you didn't say like, oh, and then not call it, but you went, you know, here's here's what you can do about it, and right. I feel like that's what you were doing with the other organizations. So when you were like, probably when you were doing your, um, that uh, paper, when you like, um, what was the other one? Sorry, I'm looking, all my cards are all over the place. Okay. <laughs> um, when you, um, when you were, aware of what that group needed and that the the old way like that they needed that the the tables and they the didn't need right mm -hmm. yeah like all of that i think is based like that you're just you can well it's a pulling together again <laughs> so you're really good at like like pulling together and giving order to projects but pulling over the resources that people need in order yeah. to amplify the voices i um, like that word amplify and the fourth one that i see is that you are able to create create programs or offerings or events or spaces, whatever word you want to use, like you can focus in, um, that people really want. <laughs> so if you ever want to sell a course, <laughs> like if I wanted to sell a class, mm -hmm. I would want you on my team because I bet you I could say, hey, you know, no one's buying my course. <laughs> what am I missing that like that they need, right. you would probably be incredible at going, oh, I'll talk to the people. And figure <laughs> out what, what they need. need. I'll yeah. figure out what they need. And then I'll yeah. pull it all together and share it for you. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like you, um, and all of that's probably like great, great listening. How do any of those feel for you? Do you think I'm off? No, I don't. I just never... I, I never thought to, I had a mentor who used to say, you should, you know, engage in graceful self-promotion. I don't think I learned how to do that until just this moment. <laughs> I'm like, 
Oh, that's all the, the graceful self-promotion language that I've been looking for for like 10 years now. So this is, yeah, all of it sounds really, um, really spot on. And uh, it also aligns with exactly what's in my, like my top five to 10 strengths. So it all makes sense. Yeah. Beautiful. I love mm -hmm. it. So in a, in a statement and like the, like, so when you're at this point in the process, you don't have mm -hmm. to take these skills and like make it your headline or advertise them right now. It can be for you. And then you yeah. can think of how to creatively do it. But I feel like yeah. this, the statement might be something like, mm, like I am the most, I'm the most useful when I am pulling together, <laughs> um, like I think information, lived experience um, of people, and then putting it into a plan. Mm -hmm. I cr I create things in response to need. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly if I have to create something just from like just because. Yeah, like that to me is really difficult. But if I have, I guess it goes back to needing to also feel like I'm making a difference, right? And doing meaningful work. But it is exactly that. It is creating things in response to someone else's need most of the time. Yeah. 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 And I would like, I don't know what you're doing, <laughs> you know, career wise now, <laughs> but I would go like the way you want to use this is you want to make sure that any job that you applied for, any project that you started, anything you got involved in, mm -hmm allowed you to do these four things most of the time yeah right so allowed you to work with people mm -hmm. that allowed you to pull together resources and make things happen yep. right and that yep. if you're able to do that most of the time you're gonna like your career well it sounds like your career <laughs> this kind of feels like a very easy one because your career is pretty incredible so far. well thank you it's been a very windy road but it's been a good one yeah and um yeah, social science and community development. Um, that's not easy. That's not easy work. It's not. It's that's not, not easy. No. no. Yeah. And it attracts all the helper types. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's what I have. Like, that's what I what I have. So things to do with this, write it on a sticky note, <laughs> you know, and put that sticky note, like behind your computer. So every time you're writing or connecting, you remember okay. what's good about it. Um, I've even like written it out as lines on the paper in a journal, yeah. said it out loud, like to myself in the mirror so that I mm -hmm. remember just to mm -hmm. ground yourself in, Hey, the things that I'm really super at is pulling all these things together, making it happen. I create what people want. Yeah, <laughs> right? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I will do that. I will absolutely do that. Um, and write it in my journal. Yeah. And on my sticky notes that I have all over the place. Yeah. Cause yeah. it just takes you out of the um, labeling yourself as like whatever title or, and a lot of people from academia will also um, just <laughs> name their degrees, right? You're so much more. <laughs> it's, so, it's such a big part of our identity, especially when we're going through the process of like when you, you know, the graduate degrees, the PhD in particular, it, when you finish, you have to sometimes refine yourself because that is your identity for four or five years at least. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah cool. Sweet. Um, so I'll let you go because you, okay. I don't know what your fixer person was doing. Like, go, well, <laughs> make sure I, they I did. That <laughs> office door is installed finally. So yes, I'm so excited. So I'm going to go check on my office doors and I'm going to tune in later to look at the Q&A. But thank you so much, Carrie. Yeah. This was fabulous. This is fun. Uh, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah, for being okay. generous to share the story. No problem. Okay. I muted myself. Um, so I'm here just for another. Um, boy, I'm just like, how long am I here? For but another like five minutes or so. But if uh, you have a question about what we were doing there, uh, any questions about the books or using stories in your careers, let me know. Um, once one question that often comes up is that people see um, this first part of their story and they're just like, well, where do I use this story on my resume or where do I use this in an interview? And that's really <laughs> like 10 steps away. So some of the stories that Natasha shared, 
she might be able to use on her resume and her LinkedIn. The other use for those stories is she actually used the stories to help her figure out what she's awesome at. So sometimes those beginner stories, we don't use them to market ourselves at all. They just help us to confirm the story that we're telling ourselves, right? Um, cool. So um, I'm seeing a question here and I will um, answer it. How do we compile the essence of all the stories together into one brand statement? It just seems complicated to do. Yeah. So as she was writing though, like as she was telling me the stories, what I was doing and how you would do it yourself is that, um, so as she shared a story, so I'm going to find my example card. So as she shared a story, um, I, I wrote out the skill or strength that she was using in each of those stories. So I just wrote down a couple of words of kind of the essence of the skill of strength. And for each story, she did that. And then as she told a story and the same skill came up, I just put a check mark beside it. When you're doing it yourself, you have your story on the front of the card. On the back of the card, you write out all, all the skills and strengths. And then you look at all the skills and strengths together and like maybe get a highlighter, but circle the what like, yeah, circle the ones that keep popping up. So if they're showing up in seven of your stories, one same skill, it's probably a skill that <laughs> you need to highlight or work with or let it be the foundation for your work. Um, if it's a skill that maybe pops up once, it's a good to have, it's a bonus might be a strategic advantage, but if it's not coming up in all your happiest work moments, you probably don't want it. And usually it's three or four. So for, for her, I just kept hearing the story of helping people, being this great listener, um, pull, she was saying it, like pulling things together, giving voice, right? So um, yeah, that, because I kept hearing it, I was like, I think it's this, right? Uh, Paula is asking, what about if you're in the middle of an imposter syndrome crisis and you cannot find the stories that make you feel good? Hoy, yeah, so uh, it's funny. I was on a podcast, I don't know, like two weeks ago, and a person asked me, like, or we were talking about this method, and they're like, well, if you do this method, you don't have imposter syndrome because you can see what you're good at. And I was like, yeah. So if you're in the middle, I think maybe like absolutely my method assumes that you know how to get in touch with those moments. If you don't, uh, if you have the book, I would skip to step two and do some of those I love myself meditations. That one would be great. A meta practice would be great. Um, Yeah, and I think sometimes another um, common thing that happens is that some people think that the stories that they write down need to be huge, like they need to be um, about winning the award or about or bigger than they need. And when you're just trying to be like, when when might I have smiled at work, even in a completely toxic job? Was there something? Like, can you think of something that actually felt okay or good? Um, and if you're still stuck, I don't know if you have the book, but I have, um, like, I don't know, 40, 30 or 40 prompts at the back. And a lot of times when people are really stuck, just, um, reading a prompt is easier, right? So coming up from examples then, and that just gets them starting. And once you can, um, have one or two, of the prompts work usually when you come for three after day three you'll be able to find a like a story that feels good without without needing the prompts um you know but a prompt is just like you know when did you do something that made it uh made it easy for people to feel comfortable asking you questions or um sorry like right about a time you improved a process so sometimes the prompts can help you if the prompt of Work that makes your heart sing is 
not within reach right now. And it's not in within reach for a lot of people. Yeah. So don't don't extra beat yourself about up about that. Um and then Kirsten is asking, what if we can't identify the skills or strength, especially not into such <laughs> nice and unique wording that you did with Natasha? Yeah. So um again, like in the book, I have a list of um like I have a list of of common skills that come up. Oh no, I don't. I have values. I'm lying to you. Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, oh no, I do. So I have all common career skills here. Um, so see, see if any of those words work. The other is that as you're, um, you can do what I just did with her. So instead of writing out the story or after you write them out, speak them out and see if you naturally, and don't read off the card, but just say, share the story and see if there's words that keep you keep saying, and if you keep describing describing it as as something, but you know you mean another skill, um, so I'm not describing it right. Um, so if you at the back of the card were calling it problem solving, <laughs> but you notice when you speak it that you're that you're saying, oh, I help I help people sort things out, then you want to use those words help people sort things out. You. I usually lean to the more casualness of it, um, to something that's already within within your your lexicon of words and language that you already use, um, because it's going to mean more to you. And when you're selling it later, you'll be able to pull those words in. Um, the other thing is that's like sometimes you need outside help. So it's easy for me. Like my super skill is. <laughs> My super skill is just that, is being able to listen to stories and go he and make order out of it is something that I'm that I'm good at. So it might be getting some feedback. So see if there's a friend that you have that you could both do it together and then go how in casual language or not using any of the buzzwords might you describe my skills and see if that um, if they can help you there. Yeah. Um, and then David is asking, how about if you feel confident enough, could you ask others whom you trust for stories? <gasps> no, <laughs> no, don't do that. Okay. Uh, so here, I would not ask, there's that career advice of, um, you should ask pe other people what you're good at. I wouldn't. The question to ask though is, um, question to ask is, do you remember a time when we were working together that I seemed really happy and what was I doing? Do you remember a time when you were working with me and you looked over and you saw me and thought, whoa, <laughs> she's really in the flow. What was I doing? So you can ask that. I wouldn't ask other people what you're good at because they typically only see, like they only kind of see what you're good at um, in terms of how it helps them or what they've seen, but you want to see if they've witnessed you in the flow and you haven't noticed, those are really great. Um, <laughs> yeah, do you like my no? <laughs> I think so. I just see so many people, they don't want to do the work of the stories. And so they ask other people, hey, what am I good at? Um, and then they get this long list. And then I see people creating career brands based on that, but none of the words are really true to them. And so it doesn't really have, it doesn't have any meaning to it, right? It doesn't make them delighted to, you know, to share it. Um, okay. Um, question is, what if the person never got a chance to show their awesome at work? What if their super skills were never utilized? Because sometimes that happens in very conservative workplaces. So absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of people don't get to um, show they're awesome at work. So the places, I think there's kind of two places that you can look. So one, again, is work, but in those micro moments. So you know, was there a moment at work? Maybe everyone was grumbling about having to stay late um, and you're boss really, you know, pissed you off. Um, and everyone was kind of grumbling. And then you did something that changed the mood or, um, you know, <laughs> you instigate, like, see if there's, 
if there's a moment even in the grumbles that you did something that you're proud of. In these stories, no one else has to have seen it, right? So if if you felt it and if you had a taste of it and it felt good, um, it doesn't matter that no one else saw because these are just your foundation stories. The other place to look is sometimes um, from school or outside like extracurricular or um, yeah, like other side projects. So I've had clients who didn't love their day jobs, but were on like a community center board or help to organize, um, you know, a soccer team. And they're really proud of, you know, doing the research and doing the drills and, and meeting with the parents. So sometimes it can come from other, from other places. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great question. So question is, how could we do this with people who don't have lots of work experience, such as new graduates or high schoolers? Yeah. So same, um, same thing. Like my, my daughter, um, is 18. My oldest daughter is 18. Um, and has not been an excellent student, uh, never joined a club. Um, um, and this still worked for her. Um, because when we talk about moments when she felt, felt joy, there's still moments, right? And they didn't always work out. Um, so for her, she was like, oh yeah, there was a day that her regular theater teacher was sick and they had a sub and, um, and the sub came and said she got to direct a scene for that day, something that she never got a chance to do. And she really loved giving direction. Like that day was the highlight of her day, right? It was like giving that direction. The other thing that she was really great at is like whenever her friends were crying or upset is that she would be the person who would, um, you know, come, go to the washroom and comfort them, right? So immediately I can go, well, Jules, you're really super at um, like directing people, right? You're good at, at, she's good at the same thing I'm good at, but um, being able to see where the scene needs to go and get people there. And you can also meet people in the moment. And so you, I'm like, you want to study something that allows you that aunt like that respects that and you want to use that um you know when you're when you're talking about you know landing a job you want to talk about those stories right about creating order seeing a vision making it happen um yeah so sometimes they might find it you might with a student say um when you were assigned a project in school what role did you naturally take on in the group did you delegate things did you um you know, check up on people? Were you the person who was the procrastinator, but you came up with a good idea at the end or the group never knew? Were you the like pizzazz in the presentation? So see if they can find even like little micro moments of when they felt alive might work. Um, so yeah, David's saying after this, I'm really understanding how a person working through exercises versus self-esteem for that alone. Yeah, because um, it can, it can, for, I think what happens is that in regular career coaching, the first question you get asked is, what are you proud of accomplishing? And if you, and it makes the assumption that you've accomplished something. And what if you haven't, or what if you're not proud of accomplishing it? Then you immediately feel like defeated and how are you gonna sell yourself? But instead think about moments when you felt good and it might, might not come from a good place. I worked with, um, client a couple years ago. So boy, uh, he had just graduated. He'd never had a job. His mom was like, he needs to get a job. And the only thing he was really great at was video games. And so even there, I said, um, I was like, so when you're playing a video game, what have you organized? What did you do? And he talked about, you know, getting all these people from all over the world together on a mission to get, I don't know, something from a dragon. And and he, so he was talking about how he he loved bringing all these people together and the scheduling and sending out the emails. So that was that just helped him to know that he actually had those skills, right? And maybe he'd never used it professionally, but he but he had that. So I think, um, yeah, getting everyone on the same page and that he had that um, was big. And I think he ended up going into I feel like he went into marketing or something. But um, yeah, so it can come from from those experiences too. Yeah. 
Cool. I think that's good. I think that's time. Um, thanks for checking out this live. It's been nice to talk at you. I really loved talking with Natasha and hearing all her gorgeous stories. Um, yeah, my tips are if you've written out the seven stories, um, if you've written them out and you're trying to figure them out, either look from dig in deeper to the story to find the micro moment. So the way I would say to Natasha, you know, how, what did I ask her? It's like, what's the specific moment? So see if you can get even deeper to find that like specific moment. Um, do it with a friend because you can share stories and maybe they'll see each other. Um, like I have a, a career stories, I don't know what we call it, career stories club where we're all sharing stories and then we tell each other what we see in it. Um, so you know, either find either like join a group that's already doing it, or make your own group and see if you can you can help each other out. Um, yeah, that's all. So thanks so much for joining me. Have a great afternoon. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>